You're listening to Wickham Sound online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM. A very good afternoon to you. Welcome along. You are listening to Wickham Sound. Bob Johnson with you through until four o'clock bringing you this afternoon a Wickham Wanderers special. Coming up at two, we will have a live commentary on our Wickham Wanderers friendly this afternoon with our Premier League side West Ham United. David Moyes' team nearly got relegated from the Premier League last season. Staying up with just a couple of games to go. What sort of test will they provide the championship chair boys? We will be finding out from 2 o'clock this afternoon. Of course, the game is behind closed doors, so if you are listening to this thinking, oh, I'll jump in the car and nip down to Adams Park, I'm afraid you won't be allowed in. But do stay with us because we will bring you live match commentary. Phil Catchpole will be in place from 2 o'clock. And we will be having a chat to him at some point in the next half an hour as well. Coming up before the game, though, we will be having a couple of interviews that Colin Besley has been carrying out recently with a Wickham Wanderers theme. We'll hear Colin's conversation with the Chief Financial Officer at Wickham, Pete Kuhik. And also Colin chatting to former Wickham Wanderer Mark Rogers as well, better known to most of us as Ted. Um, coming from uh, Vancouver, Colin spoke to him um, just after the Chairboys had achieved a promotion uh, by beating Oxford United at Wembley. Uh, we will be getting his reaction um, to Wickham going up to the Championship. Um, and also a story from him as well, uh, which was quite sad, about how actually he was over here and was about to see Wickham play right back in March. And then COVID happened, and so he didn't actually get round to seeing the Chairboys play um, in last season. But he's very much, fingers crossed, looking forward to seeing them play this season um, once, hopefully, all of the behind-closed doors is eased. And the good thing is, actually, we're hearing more and more at the moment about how football restrictions are being eased. Um, obviously, for non-league teams um, who are not in the National League, um, things have now been eased so that actually fans are being allowed back in the ground. Colin Besley um, has joined me again, fresh from his stint doing the mid-morning show, um, and he has some team news, uh, I understand. Yes, I've just done some uh, some, some warm downs myself. You never know, I might get, you know, I might get called upon. Yeah, well, you know, uh, certainly if it was this time last season, then, then definitely I think you possibly would have got a game. Um, <laughs> but, but, but luckily, those days, hopefully, fingers crossed, are behind us, and uh, yeah. you know, I don't think you'll need your boots this afternoon. If Gareth needs someone who has very little effect on a game and, uh, you know, <laughs> has very little in the way of coordination or pace, I'll, I'll be there. Uh, right. if, you, if you want someone to make the opposition laugh, sort of like when it's a corner or something, and maybe put off the goalkeeper, I think you'd be fantastic, Colin. You would definitely be on my team. <laughs> sheet um, i'd so, be concerned that the warm-up might take it out of me but apart from that i'll, I'll be ready um, and i did wonder because I, I i'm looking at the team list i i did wonder whether you are trialist cb there is a trialist cb which, yes. which i don't want to give too much away but you know, i ought to, ought to get going shortly but um yes there's a trialist cb in the starting 11 and then there's a trialist cb2 among the replacements uh, yes, I, I wasn't aware that you, you <laughs> that you had any children it's, out there. It's a game of two halves. Colin Besley Jr. Is it one might of be the me on both occasions. I'm not sure. Uh, but seriously, uh, David Stockdale uh, starting in goal. Really pleased that he's still still about. So Absolutely, he's been, he's been training with the club. Uh, Jack Grimmer uh, was, is starting. Fantastic to see him back as well. Uh, also, there's trialist LB. <laughs> I wonder which position he might be playing. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the position rather than his name. Perhaps. I, th- I, I think yeah, I think that's trialist left back. And, and then in, in surnames, just to save time, I've got Charles Thompson, Patterson, sounds like the school register, doesn't it? Uh, trialist CM. These are the positions, aren't they? These yes, aren't they, they are. Yep, yep. Uh, Cashgate, Parker and Samuel. And then among the substitutions, uh, Ryan Allsop, of course, who had a great, um, a great sort of, uh, what's the word, playoffs. Yes. Uh, Joe Jacobson, of course, who, who can score from corners. PFA uh, um, Players Player of the Year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great to have him. Uh, new signing. Um, the uh, Uche Ikpiatsu, great to be seeing him. Matt Bloomfield, of course, Mr. Wickham among the substitutions. I've missed out Dominic Gape and, um, and Mr. Stewart as well in, in this list. I don't suppose it matters the order, does it? I've uh, got Freeman, Fred on Newman as well, Trialist CB2, uh, Trialist RB, and Trialist RM. Um, and the West Ham United team, is that is that in yet? Yes, yes. We've got that. 
Uh, Martin in goal, who's Alvin Martin's son, of course. Ah, OK. Uh, uh, which is a bit of a surprise, because Alvin Martin, I always thought, would have been quite a small player. So, so it's surprising that his son is in goal. He's got the goalkeeping genes. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Uh, some great names that people will recognise as well. Lanzini, Baptiste, uh, Noble, Bowen, uh, Fornells, uh, Og- Ogbonna. Uh, there's Mansuku, Antonio, Mikel Antonio, fantastic to, to watch as well. Uh, Johnson, Cullen. Uh, Johnson, that could be yourself, of course. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I'm lining up for, for West Ham. Uh, uh, on the bench for well, them, I wouldn't be putting on the claret and blue, sorry. They seem to have uh, a lot fewer <laughs> subs than Wickham. Uh, there's Anang, in- Incanola, they're, they're mostly beginning with A. Uh, Adokwa, <laughs> Margello, Silver and Rosa. But that does sound like quite a... Quite Doesn't a, it? You know, a decent line-up. I, I, you know, I was almost wondering whether we'd have maybe sort of like West Ham's under-19 yes. squad or something like that. You, think, you, never know, you? You, you never know, in friendlies, do you, what you're going to get. Um, whereas actually, yes, you know, the, the, that does sound like quite a formidable team that we're, we're facing this afternoon. I said before when I was quite excited. Now I know the team even more excited. Um, another thing, obviously, that has happened uh, uh, this morning um, is Jason McCarthy returning to Wickham Wanderers for a fourth time um, at signing a three-year contract to complete a transfer from Millwall for an undisclosed fee. Um, the defender played nine times on loan for the Chairboys during their 2019-20 promotion winning campaign, having signed for Millwall from Wickham before a ball was kicked last summer. Prior to that, he won the Supporters Player of the Year award at Adams Park as a loanee from Southampton in 2016 and again after leaving Barnsley in 2019. He's been speaking uh, to the club about how he, how excited he is to return. I've been wanting to get back here. Um, I've been really trying to force it through, and yeah, it was a no-brainer. It really was. Like, I've, I really believe that I can play in the championship, and um, I guess I've got there a couple of times, um, having left Wickham. Um, but I never really would have dreamt or even thought that I would get the opportunity to do it with Wickham. So. It's a dream come true. I'm so excited and I'm really, really thankful for Rob, um, for Pete, the gaffer, Andrew. (laughs) Of all the people I expected as well, it's Mr Wickham who's interrupting our interviews. We'll get him back. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Uh, Yeah, I would have never expected expected it, but I'm just overwhelmed and can't wait to get started you were in full flow in your loan spell last season uh the goal on your debut the, the goal that should have been yours at bolton as well uh covid hit and I, and I know it was so hard for you not to be able to come back into the fold once once the playoffs were decided uh yeah it was tough it was really tough it was so full of mixed emotions um i was delighted and so happy for the team you know i was rooting for them i really really believed and um knew that the team would do it and they did and I was just so happy I couldn't stop crying um, when uh, when we won um, but yeah it was it was tough personally you know um, wanted to be there so much um, and as a player you know that is the reason why you, you play you want to achieve you want to do um, get winners medals and stuff like that so but I recognised that the victory was a lot bigger than just my own selfish ambition you know seeing a club that is so close to my heart like Wickham achieve and got to the championship um, is amazing and yeah as soon as it happened I, I just really wanted to come back Fantastic to hear Matt Bloomfield crashing the interview uh, behind there. And I, I wonder, was, was Gareth Band playing in the, in the background? Because it was, you know, there, there was clearly quite there was a lot of... Yeah, on, there was all sorts going on in that interview. Uh, but thank you very much to Matt Cecil uh, for carrying that out. Uh, Jason McCarthy, yes, returning to the Chairboys. Uh, and that's a fantastic signing. I think, you know, he, he will be a wonderful addition, you know, as he has been a few times to Wickham. Uh, but in the Championship, you know, I, I, I have a lot of confidence in, in our back line at the moment, the way that it's sort of shaping up. And Jack Grimmer returning as well. I, I, I keep saying getting excited, but it's so, as you mentioned um, before, one. It's so fantastic to have players coming back as well because you think once their loan spells finish, you think, oh, they, you know, they've been great for the club, but they'll probably go back now and and you know sort of carry on for their parent club. But brilliant to have such such key players who've who've been so good and to have them back and and, and it shows their commitment for the club and it shows how much they enjoyed being with Wickham originally. And, yeah, yeah. And, and really great to have them helping us out in the championship as well. I mean, I, I think it speaks volumes about Gareth as a manager. Oh, Oh, actually, you know, so many people that he's had previously on loan 
have wanted to then come and actually sign permanently. Uh, you know, you don't do that if you're you're not happy with the setup. If you don't get on with people, but clearly, actually, the you know the setup at Wickham Wanderers is so good that yes, you know, as soon as you have the opportunity to come back, all of these players, you know, Jason McCarthy, Fred Omni um, you know, have, have said, yep, yeah, right, okay, where can I sign? And back they come. And it can't be an accident that you know he's able to do so well in the loan market. You mentioned Fred when he first came; it was it was so exciting to see a player of his his caliber really lighting up the the games that Wickham were involved in. And you think, oh, you can get players from QPR, you can get players from from Millwall, and even Chelsea youngsters as well. And you know, it's it's so exciting that they'll want to come and play at Wickham. And as you say, seem to enjoy their time and, yeah. and grow as players themselves, but also pass on their influence from from a higher level to to a Wickham team and, and really help their cause as well. Now, a, a couple of weeks ago now, you had uh, the uh, pleasure of interviewing Pete Kuhig. And he uh, brought the trophy with I him. Was I was just going to say, and I was, was quite, yeah, I, I, I was quite jealous not to be here that day, because he brought the trophy with him. Um, uh, but how was that? How, how was Pete? Because he comes across as being just, just such a nice guy and a lot of fun to be around. So laid back, in fact, because I, I doubt there are many chief financial officers of football clubs who, who you feel so sort of... You seem so sort of. I saw someone online write. He seems the sort of person you'd like to go and have a drink with. Def- and, and I, <laughs> definitely, I, definitely. I would. I would totally. It'd be quite busy if everyone wanted to go and have a drink. Yeah, with him, but yeah, it would, he, but, he'd have to have some sort of. He's the sort of guy that I can imagine coming up with some sort of rotor actually to make sure that actually every Wickham fan. Yeah, you know, he he, he had a different different night, different beer with each Wickham fan because he's, he's he seems that committed. Also, as you rightly say. I don't imagine that there are many other chief financial officers at any clubs. You know, you, you say those words and you think of somebody in, you know, in a very smart suit who's probably quite removed from exactly. the club. Um, and, you know, Crunching and, numbers. And yeah, exactly. And, and, and Pete couldn't be any different to that. But really. he's clearly a fan himself as well, which I think really helps in and perhaps not all... You know, there are, there are sort of chief financial officers who are sort of very. Well, I'm sure Peter, obviously, a very successful businessman as well. But there are people who are just business people, and and perhaps they're they're looking at the club differently. But but Pete, it really comes across that he's a huge fan of well, a football, but b especially the, the club that he's now rather associated with. Okay, well, let's listen to your interview that you conducted a couple of weeks ago on at the Mid Morning Show. Um, you started off by asking him whether there was a point after the coup for Hick family brought into Wickham Wanderers that they realised something quite special was happening at Adams Park. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it kind of as everything came together at the end, of, at the tail end of preseason, leading into the season, um, open a match being against Bolton Wanderers. Um, there was a little question as to as to whether it was even going to happen. Um, turned into an absolutely beautiful day, big win, um, and then probably and so the the early results, you know, made us feel pretty comfortable about our target, which was finishing seventeenth or above. Um, but then I think September, maybe October, when we when we made it to the top of the league and started staying there, uh, and just after a, a really impressive run against some of the top top clubs in the league, um, it felt possible. But also the reality of 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 a English football season is that it's ten eleven months, and so there's a long way to go, no matter what. And and so you can never feel overly confident, but but the confidence was really there starting September October that that something really special could happen, but we weren't allowed to say it. <laughs> and there can't be anything more special than, than a Monday night at Wembley Stadium for the the playoff final. I don't know if you have any recollections of, of the night, do you? But obviously when you when you when you're reflecting over on your balcony overlooking the town, do you think that was that was quite a night? Uh, every once in a while, I have to pinch myself. Um, it was uh, a bit surreal because we were only allowed. 10 people on the guest list and three media members and so there was probably only about 150 people maybe total in Wembley which was bizarre um but we knew everybody was throwing parties the house parties all of the pubs were packed as as full as they could be under uh social distancing constraints um so it, it felt good to know that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of wanderers watching along with us and and uh you know i told somebody it, it, you, we could almost hear them uh we could definitely feel them so uh it, it was a shame that that our supporters weren't allowed in but um you know on the bright side i think more people from the area watched and and enjoyed that game to a tremendous level because it was just I think it was more people involved and it was family units that and friend groups that were just got to enjoy all of it uh, together. It must be such a, an incredible thing to, to know that it means so much to so many people. I know that you visited uh, Leslie Hobson recently. He's 97 and in his, his lifetime he'd never have imagined that the club would, would be in the second tier of English football. 
Uh, no, I, and actually just describing all the parties, it, it, it kind of chokes me up a little bit. <laughs> uh, and, <clears throat> yeah, the thing with Leslie was kind of, I, I wouldn't say impromptu, because a couple of weeks before, uh, his daughter emailed us, emailed me and, and asked if we were going to be allowing people after August 1st um, at the ground to take pictures with the stadium because her, her dad was 97 years old and been shielding since March. And, uh I asked where he where he lived, and it was in Totrich, and and so I knew that it, w- it wouldn't be too difficult to to just drop by with the trophy. And so uh, one day, Matt and I had a meeting over in Beaconsfield, and just coordinated it between a meeting in Beaconsfield and a meeting back at at at, at, at Adams Park. And we stopped by, and uh, it was uh, yeah, the look on his face when we showed up was <laughs> amazing. I'm sure you can never tire of, of seeing the trophy. I mean, you brought it with you today, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. But it's it, it's such a and you had it in the town, obviously, in Adams Park. Yeah, right? the EFL is on to me though. They made me sign a, a document last week uh, <laughs> guaranteeing its safety and it, certain other requirements. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be a little bit. I'm not going to say more careful because I guard it with my life when I take it around. But um, you know, it's. It's a good piece of silverware and doesn't just belong to the club. It belongs to all of our supporters as well. It still kind of doesn't feel real, does it? I, I guess till the first day of the season as well. It's not going it, to maybe not quite sink in, but uh, especially being sort of... No, every once in a while it feels really real. Um, <laughs> you know, there were certain things that we, had, that we have to get done before the beginning of the season. Now, there's a little leeway because of COVID. Uh, you know, typically you got two or three months between uh, getting promoted and, and starting championship play. Uh, it's obviously very condensed. Um, but immediately uh, they're putting hawk line goal goal line technology in. Um, we had to up. We had already started the work uh, and had gotten bids on upgrading the lights because currently I think they're at 500 lumens and championship uh, requires 800. So uh, we ordered those a couple weeks ago and should be in in time for the beginning of the season. Hopefully, uh, what else? We actually did a lot of work. Um, we only had five or six people on the business side uh, that that worked through the furlough season, um, and only a couple on the player side. But we actually spent quite a bit of time over those over those months um, doing lots of bits and pieces, putting everything together for this year. Um, and and we really worked uh, from scenario planning for both. Um, uh, you know, obviously released uh, season tickets a while ago. Um, I, I think everybody thought they were a little bit expensive for League One. Um, but, we, you know, we kind of figured we we're going to make it up to the championship, and they'd be some of the cheapest tickets in the championship. So I think they're well-priced now. Um, currently working on how to fit in. We capped the season tickets at 2500 uh, I think we're going to be releasing a... Uh, a waiting list program here shortly, uh, but we're working on trying to figure out how to fit the 2,500 in under social distancing rules and regulations. Obviously, football is taking it very, 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 very seriously. Um, otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be playing. Um, and so there's just, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of stuff that we're doing with the number of employees that we have, I think we have 11 or 12 working full time on the business side right now. Obviously, everybody on the football side's um, 100%. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I would, I would, I would venture to guess the next, you know, the next championship club up has probably five times as many as employees as we do. But um, and COVID has sort of forced us to reimagine how we're going to do this um you know i'd say scenario plan and you know when i look at the budgeting process and and we're finalizing our budget for next year you know we we have to look at two of them one of them is okay here's what reality is probably going to look like and here's what it would look like if we had the stadium full as we would expect being in the championship and it's it's you know it's sad from two perspectives to look at the left column because I know we're not going to get that uh, you know which you know the, that that level of money would seriously impact our finances positively, but on the other side I also know that uh, not as many people will be able to enjoy championship football live this year. Um, but you know the EFL and all the clubs are working on a program to where when. Uh, our, our ticket holders are not allowed in. They're going to be able to watch on iFollow. Um, so, 
you know, I know the uh, the talking to some of the away lads. Uh, you know, I think they're still planning on doing away trips, but just watching in you know watching in the pubs if they're open. Um, and so I, I think everybody's sort of adjusting to a new reality, um, and we'll just have to figure it out as it goes along. I mean, you can't help but feel sorry for the number of clubs who are obviously struggling uh, because of the coronavirus. But how, how big a boost is it for the club to, to have got promotion? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, League One was going to be very, 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 very difficult for us. Um, but, uh, you know, to be completely blunt, going up, even under the situation, because we do have – our aim has always been to be sustainable, and so – we understand how that affects what we're allowed to spend on the playing budget. Uh, you know what? That's one of the reasons why we only have 11 employees, and we're not going out and hiring 100 people just because every other championship club has 100 employees. Um, but we are probably one of the more financially stable clubs in the championship, which seems crazy. But it's because uh, that big boost, um, as far as the league revenues go, uh, was massive for a club like ours. And have you experienced a lot of extra interest from um, companies who want to be associated with the club now that they're in the higher level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we, we just were in the process of doing the kit release, um, which was a little bit delayed because we do have a new front of kit sponsor, uh, hometown company, Dreams. Their headquarters are located in High Wickham. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, there has been a flood of commercial activity that we're just trying to keep up with. Um, you know, uh, you know, one of the cool things that we're working on right now is actually LED sideline advertising, um, which is seems crazy to think about in Adams Park, but um, it's going to be a great money maker for the club. Uh, and and <laughs> you know, we, when I first looked at Adams Park, there were things that I sort of dreamed about seeing. Uh, LED advertising on the sides was one of them, and I, I certainly didn't think it would be happening in month thirteen, but. Um, here we are. And you've already looked at improving the broadband and other sort of really technical yeah, technological improvements. Yeah, there is a ton of work behind the scenes. Uh, we've recently signed a deal with a company called Landways that is one of the leading providers of digital infrastructure in stadiums in the UK. It's kind of a startup business. They've done a few stadiums. Um, I went to a Gloucester rugby match last year to, to, to test the system, and it was absolutely amazing. I was getting, you know, six, whatever, huge download numbers. I, I, I literally watched, I, I tried to see if I could watch a football match during a rugby match and I was able to pull it down um, so yeah a lot of work uh, is going towards that but the reason there's two reasons for the for the digital infrastructure a uh, our, our supporters will be able to use Wi-Fi in the in the stands but it'll also enable us to contactless payments at every at, at every kiosk uh, it'll Extremely, it'll improve the turnstile system because our uh, our, our scanners for the ticketing pro will will be linked in. Um, we actually one of the commercial deals we just worked was with a local company where we've got new displays that are going in all over the stadium. Um, so all those uh, old old TVs that everybody is always complaining about that you can't see the score on that's uh, a thing of the past. Um, you know, once we do have folks back in the in the in the Caledonia and the in all the in all the boxes and everywhere around the stadium, there's going to be you know great displays. You're going to be able to watch matches pre-game, post-game, um, plenty in in you know in shots from in-game. It, it, it's it's really the step up next year in the stadium. Um, you know, I hesitate to even talk about because. You know, I kind of want people to experience it as they go in because it's it's still going to be quaint old Adams Park, uh, but it will be stepping into the 21st century pretty heavy over the next uh, over the next few months. Fantastic! You, you mentioned the, the kit. Uh, it'd, yes. be, it'd be remorse of me not to not to sort of perhaps probe you a little further about that because there's going to be sort of speculation. I, I read on uh, social media that someone's suggesting that, that that the big swan will be gone and replaced by a big chair instead. I don't. I, <laughs> I, do, uh, I don't know if that's uh, uh, you know some the insider information. Are extremely intriguing. Uh, you know, I I, I, I kind of like playing with some of the uh, folks out there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, so obviously, uh, we'll always be in quarters. Um, but it is a new quarters home kit design. Home kit design. Uh, we do have uh, the same change kit. Uh, Club Charter only allows for the home kit to be changed every two years, and the away kit changed every uh, every other year as well. And so, where they're kind of every other year, you get a new home kit, you get a new change kit next year. This year, we'll be having a third kit. 
uh, which I think will be uh, I think everybody's going to really like b- both the new home kit and the third kit uh, we really think are probably going to be the, some of the biggest sellers we've ever seen we also bought a little uh, so the last few years uh, the goalkeeper kit designs um, have gone from one extreme to the other we got a, you know Baz Richo out there uh, probably put together some of the craziest goalkeeper kits the world has ever seen uh, Andy Fairman has since come in and he's the opposite end of the spectrum um, and next year we will have uh, both ends of the spectrum you know we'll have Andy sort of Plainish, it's 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 a little bit of an ad- adaptation on the on the current black kit this year, um, that kind of fits within the motif of all the other gear, uh, but the uh, change goalkeeper kit, uh, the color has been deemed Mardi Gras. Ooh, yes. Is that a, is that a sort of Louisiana thing? Yeah, it is. Mardi Gras is a big day in Louisiana, uh, y- you know, and uh, so y- when I saw some of those old keeper kit designs. Um, <laughs> there was no way I was going anywhere near some of the bonkers stuff, but it definitely got me thinking about uh, maybe incorporating one of the craziest things uh, in Louisiana into into the design, which is um, the, Mar- the Mardi Gras. And the colors are, but the co- the colors are also uh, you know related to um, English history as well. Um, it, to me, it kind of looks like the the colors are. Uh, what's a good word other than I don't know, they look great, <laughs> they're crazy uh, Pete Kirk, the Chief Financial Officer of Wicked Wanderers I'm very pleased to say is with us uh, we've, we've probed him about the kit I think another thing that, that fans always want to know about is, is new signings, they always want you to announce something don't they, or, or has Gareth given you a, a shopping list for, for, the, uh, for the new season uh, Yeah, we're um, working the free agent market right now um, definitely taking a lot of calls uh, the transfer window is open until October. Um, as I said, we spent a lot of time working on next year. We had, we're going into next year with 17 guys already signed. Um, so we've got our core squad from last year that's ready to go. Um, and it's just going to be about doing the Wickham business during the, during the window. So I can promise you, Gareth and Dabo and the boys are looking at about a million videos. Uh, and, and we are taking the Wickham approach um, and trying to get as good as as good a deal as we can out there, but being patient while we're doing it. Um, we've already actually started. We hired a B-team coach, Sam Grace. We've already got trialists coming in. Um, you know, adding some numbers to the um, some numbers to the to the squad uh, for training, and so taking a look at, at at what's available out there from the from the younger guys' perspective. But um, we should be releasing. Uh, uh, I'll use the same word that I use with my buddy Clifty. An- signings will be announced soon. And I'm sure you can't speak highly enough of, of what Gareth and his management team have done to a to get the club to where they are, but also in the, in the sort of behind the scenes because I'm sure fans only really see what's going on on a match day as well. Yeah, uh, I, I feel really, for- really, really, really fortunate to watch uh, what that backroom staff does um, during the week, during the match days. Um, it is. Uh, it was the thing that most impressed us about Wickham when we first got here uh, was Gareth and Dabo and, and the rest of the guys' approach towards that side of the business. Um, it's just uh, it's really impressive um, because they do not look at just talent. Um, psychological profiling uh, is an extremely important part of the process. Um, and the amount of research they do on individuals that they're looking to sign is... Uh, Extremely diligent, let me put it that way. And what's your sort of message, if you like, to the, to the fans about uh, your uh, relationship with them, obviously going into this new season? Because I know, obviously, fantastically that um, throughout the, the lockdown period, your appearances on, on Chairboys Live, fans have felt so, so more, more, much more sort of connected to you, and you must have felt that's been a great sort of outlet. Uh, yeah. But also a brilliant way to sort of get to know the club as well. Yeah, that, uh, that, was, a, that was something that, that Matt came up with. We were, you know, we were in total lockdown. Um, and it was almost sort of an outlet for us to he, – he just came up with – I mean, we were both kind of a little stir-crazy. Um, you know, you spend eight, nine months in a season like that, and then all of a sudden you're locked in your flat. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. There were some pretty dark days in there. Um, and, 
you know, Matt and I getting that going um, was a way to connect with all of the people associated with the club that we missed, um, you know, and, and it wasn't just the guests. It was it, it was a lot of the people that were uh, making comments on the on the on the on the little chat thing that went along with Chair Boys. And, and, and it was just um, it was one of those things that if you planned it, it wouldn't have come off as well. Uh, and it, but just the fact that it kind of. I, I promise you it helped Matt and I make it through lockdown, um, and it was r- really good to, that, to see that it, it, it kept a lot of our supporters engaged through a very rough time. And you must be so excited to be bringing championship football to Adams Park, despite the uncertainty, because I know obviously the, the fan match day experience is something that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, regardless of whether we've got supporters in the stadium or not, Wickham are in the championship. And so uh, everybody just needs to enjoy this for what it is, which is no matter where we finish on the table, this will be the highest finish in Wickham Wanderers history. And so uh, it is going to be a tough, 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 tough road to hoe. Um, some of the clubs will outspend us 25-fold. Uh, if not more, and so, but we all know that our team is special not because we can afford you know the most expensive players, but it's because of the type of players that we bring in, the type of mentality that we have as a team, uh, the tactical uh, and psychological prowess of our management team. So every time we go out there next year, uh, we're going to be prepared for battle. I can promise you that. Um, not all the results will go our way. There might be some tough days, but all we can ask is is that our supporters truly understand what we're trying to do. And anything above 24th is the best finish ever. 23rd would be incredible. Uh, achieving and staying up next year would be an even greater accomplishment accomplishment than making it to the championship so we're very rational about our expectations for next year but we also still believe that it can be done because we've done miracles before that's Pete Kuhig, the uh, Chief Financial Officer of uh, Wicker Wanderers, speaking to our very own Colin Besley a uh, few weeks ago. I'm delighted to say now that we can cross to Adams Park um, and speak to our commentator this afternoon, Phil Catchpole. Good afternoon, Phil. Hello, Bob. How are you? Yeah, I'm very, very good. How are things there? Um, I, I have to say, I was a little bit worried sort of driving in through the pouring rain that actually the, the first game of the season might not go ahead. But I think things have got a little bit better since then. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lovely setting here. You know, for anyone who's been anywhere near Sands and, and Adams Park knows the beautiful surroundings we're in. We've got some blue skies, a bit of cloud, but the wonderful greenery and the trees behind the, the stands is looking resplendent. The pitch looks like a snooker table, which is, uh, which is great to see as well. Uh, and the, both sets of teams are out warming up as we speak. Wickham in their very nice, shiny new training kits. A couple of uh, strange faces out there. Some trialists going to be involved today as well. But do you know what? It's just great to be at live football and count myself as very lucky to be here to tell the story today. Um, how, how does the stadium look as well? Because I understand that possibly there have been a, a couple of improvements during the summer. Uh, yeah, nothing seen. Yeah, I think I'm looking at the floodlights. They still look like the same ones. I know they're going to be changed uh, before the season. So we've got a few weeks before it all kicks off here at Adams Park. Um, but yeah, nothing as such. I mean, there's still the banners behind the, uh, in the away stand, uh, thanking the NHS, etc. Um, but other than that, it's, uh, it's looking pretty similar to what it used to be, apart from today, because of all the equipment here on this side. Uh, I'm in the Frank Adams stand today, which is unusual for me, because normally the press box is on the other side in the, uh, in the, in the old main stand. Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in new surroundings. I've never seen a game of football on this side. I'm seeing out the other half of Liverpool. So, so uh, the, just, just filling in then for people who don't actually know, so, so you're broadcasting live this afternoon on not only on Wickham Sound, but you're also on YouTube as well, so people can go on YouTube and can watch the game live on there. That's right, yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit of a brave new world for all of us. Uh, and I'm looking around at the level of uh, amounts of equipment here. It's like walking onto a film set. Box. There's cameras everywhere. There's people sat in exec boxes with uh, loads of computer screens and big boxes of wires and stuff that... But pretty complicated, but they assure me it's all going to work brilliantly. So, hopefully, the commentary will match up to it. <laughs> Fantastic! Well, it sounds very impressive for you know for a pre-season friendly. The the fact that it looks like a film set that that's pretty good. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the playoffs were like were being in, on a being at a TV show as well. So I'm kind of getting my head around all of that as well. This is my fourth game now behind closed doors, and um, you know it's a challenge in itself and not having fans here and stuff but you do get to hear what goes on on the pitch and what the managers and the players say to each other 
uh, which adds another element to it as well, just to kind of find out what do footballers say to each other during a 90 minutes. We've often wondered, and, and now we can find out. Now, I was lucky enough to um, go along to the uh, Fleetwood semi-final game at Adams Park, and it was very noticeable that Gareth had asked all of the people there that, that were, were of the Wickham persuasion actually to make as much noise as they could. Um, and, a, and a few of the neutrals did comment that it was like having a home crowd there. Um, is there any sign of uh, Pete Kuhig, Bill Turnbull, anyone like that to, to lead the cheerleading this afternoon? No sign of Bill and Bill today. I think he's, uh, he's on his other radio station today, but Pete's here. Uh, in his sort of capacity now as, I think, CFO of the club as well. So he's heavily involved in absolutely everything that's going on here. Uh, I looked to my right and Jason McCarthy sat uh, on a seat down to my right-hand side. He was announced this morning as signing a new three-year deal at Wickham Wanderers. It was good to see him. But, of course, I mean, pre-seasons, everyone you know, will look at the result and everything. But these sorts of games, and I, and I don't want to sound too much like Gareth Angel here, it's, it's all about getting the, the fitness into the players that Wickham do own. And they'll be having a good look at a few trialists today as well who will be trying to impress and get their way either into this first-team squad or this B-team squad that Wickham Wanderers are looking to um, get up and running this coming season as well. I mean, it's fantastic news about Jason McCarthy, and we do say this often. It, it's so wonderful that players off, you know, obviously want to come back to Wickham Wanderers. You know, it, it clearly is such a good setup that Gareth Hainsworth got that as soon as they got the option to come back, if they've been to us on loan previously, that you know they're, they're keen to sign on the dot, dotted line. Exactly. Once you once you come to work, I think it's very difficult to leave. And when you do leave, you don't have to wait too long before the chance comes uh, to come back. And they don't have to think twice to come back to Wickham Wanderers. Um, I don't know if you've read the book or if anyone listening to this has read the book. The book by Neil Harmer, Close Quarters, um, is a brilliant encapsulation on on the culture and the spirit that Wickham Wanderers is built upon. Really, it's it's the one thing that that they have in abundance. I think because they've got no money compared to other teams, but what they do have is this incredible bond a bond of brothers, you know, the family vibe they have here. And that's why they're in the championship. And for Jason McCarthy, I think it's the fourth time he's come back to this club. And he think he's, I think he said this is the last time I'm coming back. I think he said he wants to stay here forever. And to come out with, you know, players often throw these glib comments around and stuff. But, but with, with Jason, I think I, it's absolutely true. I spoke to him before the playoffs when he'd gone back to Millwall and he sounded absolutely gutted and crushed that he couldn't take part in the playoffs. And he was having to watch his... his former teammates as it was then go into the biggest games of their careers and I'm sure he's going to be absolutely delighted to be back here in the championship to, to help Wickham in the championship also this is the third time for him into the championship and he's never really had the chance to shine at that level and he's going to be looking to do that now with his mates which is fantastic for him and hopefully for the fans too I mean amazing that he says as well he wants to stay at Wickham forever considering he's only 24 you know he's, he's not a player sort of like you know he's thinking oh I've got a couple of years to go and then I'm going to retire he's only 24 so the fact he's saying he wants to stay forever that's really good news yeah hope to be 24 again eh, Bob? <laughs> absolutely right we've got about 15 minutes till kick off I'm sure you've got lots of preparation to do so we will let you go but we will be joining you in about 10 minutes time live on the, the YouTube stream Brilliant. Fingers crossed that all this technology works, Bob. Uh, don't worry, we've got our fingers and toes firmly crossed for you as well. <laughs> uh, Phil, many, many thanks. Phil joining us live from Adams Park. We will be back with him in about ten minutes' time. Love music, love talk, love Wickham Sound. And the referee blows his whistle. I think our clock on the, on the screens may be wrong uh, because it says 43 minutes. Or maybe they just agreed to play 43 minutes, Brian. Well, you know, a cup of tea may be on the go, so uh, they're off. But um, I think certainly whether it's 43 or 45 minutes Gareth's got plenty to think about and plenty to talk about with these players um, one of the things is you've you've got to match these teams Many thanks uh, to uh, Phil Catchpole um, and also Brian Jeeves uh, for first half commentary not going Wickham's way at the moment uh, Wickham Wanderers at 1 West Ham United at 4 um, and Colin Besley including uh, one, one of the um, worst own goals that you might actually see I did feel really, really sorry for David I Stockdale. I so felt sorry for him. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, it's the sort of thing you'd expect to see on some sort of compilation, wasn't it? it, it really, wor it, yes. Worst things that ever happened to a goal. He had his head in his hands afterwards as well. It was that, yeah. It, the whole thing was just uh, painful. Um, uh, let, let's, let's have another listen to um, the, the, the West Ham second goal. Now Curtis Thompson. We can be a bit of possession here, but very much inside their own half. Darius Charles under pressure from Bowen has to go back to David Stockdale. We go for Wickham who lets it run under his boot and it's gone in. And that is a dreadful, dreadful error from David Stockdale. It will go down as an own goal. 
from Darius Charles, but the ball just about had enough pace to trickle over the line for West Ham's second goal of the afternoon. Uh, an embarrassing moment, even in pre-season. Just one of those things, though. You know, to, to be fair to David Stockdale, to, and much better to do it in a pre-season <laughs> friendly than to be doing it in the first championship game against Rotherham, for Of example. course. I mean, you often think of pre-season games, the score doesn't matter so much. It's just the... But, but the way you concede a goal, I suppose, is something for the manager to think about when yeah, it comes to... Oh, just... Yeah, you know. And, and you just think, oh, you know, I've, I really want him to do well. You yeah. Know, it's nice to see him playing this afternoon. You know, I've got a lot of time for Ryan Allsop, but, you know, David Stockdale as well. And then you do something like that. And like you say, you know, even though it was a pre-season friendly, you know, afterwards it was very telling that the camera then picked him up with his head in, you know, it literally in his hand. it was the wind. Just, the wind's oh. a bit like Storm Francis. Yeah. <laughs> Must be so true. difficult to play in, in, in Storm Francis. Storm Great Francis. goal by Storm Francis. Yes, there. yeah. Oh, dear. Yes. Storm Francis sounds like an American midfielder. He does, actually. Yes, <laughs> I, could, I could imagine him. You know, I, I see that Wickham are being linked with Storm Francis. Uh, you know, or, uh, being loaned from Columbus Crew or one of those sort of clubs. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but no, uh, definitely feel for David Stockdale. And also for Darius Charles, who doesn't actually really deserve that own goal that no. would now be next to his name. He thought he was doing such a good yeah, deed. He did, exactly. I'll, just, I'll just knock it back to the goalkeeper, no problem. No danger. Um, but, you know, I suppose we shouldn't be too surprised that the score is 4-1 to West Ham United. You know, they, they clearly they bought a decent team this afternoon. It's not the under-19s, which we wondered whether it might be. Um, and, you know, and their, their premiership class is telling at the moment. Well, the likes of Mikel Antonio alone, he had such a good sort of back end of the season, didn't he, for, for West Ham and really helped to get them out of trouble with his goal. So it's no surprise that he, um, he is someone who can, can sort of hit the back of the net. And then when you've got the opposing goalkeeper to help you as well, then <laughs> he'll be... That'll be, and, and obviously very strange that Wickham are playing in their training kit as well. You imagine that's just for sort of commercial purposes, but yes. you, you have to feel sorry for any commentator. Well, he's indeed, not, yes. he's not familiar you know, I mean, the... you know in, in the first couple of minutes, we struggled slightly while we were tra- t- uh, struggling to link up with Phil Catchpole. I think he's doing a sterling job this no, afternoon definitely. because, you know, even though, yes, OK, at least it's the team that he knows that, that aren't wearing numbers this afternoon, it's still a tricky job to actually identify them. Um, from you know, some distance as yeah, well. Yeah, from, from some distance, uh, but Phil doing very, very well there. Um, it it hasn't all been bad, though. Of course, we have had one Wickham Wanderers goal to enjoy. Cross comes in from Parker. Drops to Patterson at the back post. Great save from Bert onto the bar. And then Samuel taps it in. Wickham have a goal back from a set piece. Parker whips in a delicious delivery. Patterson with the goal-bound header. Martin with a fingertip onto the crossbar. And Alex Samuel, for his second goal in pre-season, gets Wickham back in this one. It's Wickham 1, West Ham 2, half an hour play. A delicious delivery is really what you want on a, on a Tuesday lunchtime. As well. It definitely is, and and prolific now. Alex Samuel yeah, scoring for the second game running, albeit the game that they played um, against Southampton was was called a practice match. Yes. Um, which you know, I'm not quite sure why why it was differentiated in that it was a practice game and this one's a you know is a friendly. Uh, but even so, he's got got two goals uh, in two games. And that'll do him really good for the start of the season as well, because he, he had a very good sort of uh, playoff campaign as well, and and really showed that. I suppose during the season he he, was, he didn't really as I say he hasn't got loads of goals. Akin Fenwell seemed to get all the sort of the acclaim for his, his goal scoring, uh, especially and obviously Joe Jacobson as well and, and others who've, who've contributed with their <laughs> the Joe Jacobson sp- a special. Yes, exactly. But um, but no, I'm really pleased for Alex Samuel. He he obviously works really really hard and and, and great reward for him to get those two two preseason goals. 2.54, you are listening to Wickham Sound. Our coverage of Wickham Wanderers' game against West Ham United uh, at half-time. It is Wickham Wanderers 1, West Ham United 4. Um, we do have some more exciting news uh, with regards to Wickham Wanderers' coverage coming up in the new season. Uh, Colin joins me once again. Mr Besley, uh, you are going to be taking it to the airways, as am I, with a brand new show. It's very exciting. What's it called, Bob? It is called The Wickham Wanderers Show. What's it about? It's about Wiccan Wanderers. What will be in it? Oh, uh, when is it? Uh, when is it? Uh, when is it is a good question. So when is it? So it is going to launch on uh, the Thursday, the 10th of September. Um, so it is um, after the, the Brentford game and before they, they start the league season uh, at home to Rotherham. Um, it will be on a Thursday evening between 7 and 8 o'clock. It's very exciting, isn't it? Uh, looking forward to it very what, much. What will be on it? Uh, well, hopefully lots of stuff all about Wickham. We hope to hear every week uh, from Gareth Ainsworth. Uh, we hope to have uh, some Wickham players joining us in the studio. Um, we also hope to be speaking to ex-Wickham players, um, as you obviously did recently with regards to people like Mark Rogers. Um, and very much aim, you know, focusing on the club. Absolutely. Hopefully some chats uh, with Wickham Wanderers ladies as well. Uh, we've spoken in the past to Captain Charlotte Bagshaw, uh, to Dave 
Uh, Ward, who's their manager, to Tara Woodward as well. So fantastic to see how they get on their season as well, because their their season obviously was cruelly ended uh, last season as well when they were going so well. So it'd be great to, to feature them and perhaps some behind the scenes stuff at the club as well. Um, some some sort of a new. Perhaps we'll get to speak to the groundsman to find out what it get what. <laughs> maybe to, to find out what goes into preparing the Adams Park pitch and, and just other sort of behind the scenes stuff really which is really nice sort of um, sort of yeah behind the scenes look at the club and, and what goes into to putting a match on and, and yeah like you say what it's like being a player and what it's like at the training ground be fantastic we are we will be looking to, to do a podcast as well um, of the show so it will be available so it's not you know not, not only actually on Wickham Sound but it will be available as a podcast as well also very very exciting news I'm very excited I'm, I'm looking forward to it and we hope as well to, to get Pete Kuhig in um, occasionally because he was very very well, correct when he came indeed you know as, the, as we've already heard from your interview with him today uh, he's you know he's definitely an entertaining individual and somebody who's you know who, who has a lot to say when he's on on radio definitely and uh, Matt Cecil from the club was saying that um, uh, when Rob Kuey can, can travel over as well, he'd be very pleased to, to be a guest on the program as well. I mean, that would be really interesting. I'd like to speak to, to Rob just you know just because he's a guy who sounds like he's had a really interesting life. For no, a start. definitely. Um, you know, he's done his own radio show. He's been involved in politics. Um, he's um, owned a very successful baseball team. Um, and, and again, he comes across. So I don't think there are many sort of club owners or club chairmen who uh, I, I've met a few club owners and club chairmen in my time as well. So I can say this from experience. But who are so you know they feel so sort of passionately about the club and and just come across as a fan as well which i think is fantastic for for someone in his position as well i think it's very impressive as well that actually they've done this within a season mm. you know i i think first of all you know we all thought oh th- you know this all all sounds quite good and then there's always a little voice inside your head that's saying yeah but is it one of those things that, you know it's this slightly too good to be true and you think you know well once yeah they they've taken over you know, are they almost going to be taking off their Scooby-Doo type masks and we're going to think, oh, goodness me. And that hasn't happened at all. And as you rightly say, you know, within a season, actually, you hear Rob and you hear Pete talking and you just think it's as if they've been fans of Wickham Wanderers for years and years. Because I think people's perception of, especially American owners, you know, you think of Manchester United and Liverpool and, and you think these are people who, you know, are putting their money into the club, but are they really fans of the club or, or do they really get what English football is about and, and how... You know, fans want their sort of match day experience to be, but you get the impression from from listening to to Rob and Pete, especially and and Missy as well, speaking that you know they they want to do so much to make the the match day experience better and and to make the fans really feel a part of the club as well. And I, what I really like as well is that yes, they, you know they respect the traditions. When you were asking Pete about the kit, mm. you know the very first thing he said was, "Well, it'll still have the quarters." Yeah, straight away. You know, with, without any prompting, you know he knew what everyone was thinking. You know. He probably doesn't remember the debacle several years ago where actually the shirt didn't have quarters no. and everyone was up in arms about it, you know. But straight away, you know, he just puts your mind to rest about those sort of things. And I think that makes you think, well, yeah, you know, it, it's OK. We're in safe hands here. We're in good hands. As you say, they're so, they come across as being so aware of the traditions of, of the football club, but also English football generally as well, of, of you know, what, what fans want from a, from a game. Because you imagine it'll be transformed into some sort of, uh, you know, tailgate parties on a Saturday or something. But, but if with with Americans coming, but they really do get the sort of the match day experience that that fans want from you know from food to to what you, you heard Pete say in the interview about screens at the games and in the, in the boxes and the suites and everything like that 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 fans will really enjoy the opportunity to to not only enjoy the game hopefully and and, and get a lot from that but also their their afternoon or evening out. I've never quite got the tailgate parties thing. I have to no, say, I'm very, I'm very, you know, I'm into my American sport, and I've been to America and seen quite a lot of sport. But one thing that I've never got is their love of getting to a sport event maybe six or seven hours early, parking it in a in a parking lot, you know, just a, a, basically a concrete, you know, sort of like, like you know, a bit of a city, and and then basically sort of staying in the car and 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 drinking. But for several it's hours, it's so weird. You know, at Twickenham, they no, have to have we, we go to the pub. pub, you know, which is the sensible thing to do. You would think exactly. The whole pre-match experience or post-match experience is very, very, very different here. But, but like you say, they, they certainly seem to, seem to sort of get that and want to enhance that with with the Chairboys Village as well and, and other entertainment on, on at the ground as well. Right, the players are back out on the pitch, so we are going to cross it back live now to Phil Catchpole and Brian Jeeves well, at Adams Park. Changes are if any. I'm just having a look round, they don't look like they've made too many, if any, yet. Well, it's, uh, it's a tough ask, isn't it, for commentators in pre-season because after the players, you don't know their name and then uh, they make about nine subs all at the same time. But, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep across it as much as we can. 
Well, what we can tell you is he's a score. So Wickham need a, an early goal in his second half. I know it's not about results at pre-season, but you know, for strikers, Alex Samuel got a goal for Wickham in that first half. He's second of pre-season, and he'll look to uh, keep that form going because goal scoring is a habit, isn't it? Yeah, he looked sharp, didn't he? And, and it was a, a poacher's goal followed up after the ball had come back off the crossbar and as you said you know goal scorers they, they don't care how they go in do they they, they just want to see that net ripple and getting a couple pre-season it just takes that pressure off a little bit just looking around West Ham look as if they're the same as they were in the first half so um, which bear in mind they're sending squads to, to Ipswich as well and then tonight there's an under 23 side going to Orient I would imagine that they will get as many minutes into these players as they can um, looking at the team sheet here, they've only got six on the bench anyway. Yeah, I think Grimm has come off as well. Is that a right-back trialist? That's come across to this near side, so... It's just Anthony Stewart, the familiar face across the back. Ryan Allsop has replaced David Stockdale in goal as well, as West Ham gets underway in this second half, attacking from right to left as we look at it from our position in the Frank Adams stand here at Adams Park. I'm always watching. <laughs> Referee says... Oh, that's it. Bang on the 90. He's got somewhere to be. And uh, full-time whistle goes. And the full-time score of Wickham 1, West Ham United 5. Uh, decent workout, though, for both teams, Brian. Wickham, from a Wickham perspective, who's caught the eye today? Well, it, it, so in the, the uh, second half, really, really impressed me. First half, I, I was looking at Jack Grimmer. I thought did ever so well. Patterson, Casket, Samuel all worked very, very hard. And um, look... The, the first half will have told Gareth more about his players because there were so many little errors and mistakes that, that he will get into them about second half, though. What an improvement. Now, that first 10 minutes, we, we, you could see that they, they bought into what he'd obviously said to them. And this, the second half, they were a lot more competitive. Yeah, looking at the trialists um, in, in the first half, uh, left-back trialist, centre-midfield trialist um, and uh, centre-back trialist. Uh, let's start with the left-back trialist. We saw plenty of him purely because West Ham using Bowen as an outlet, but he, he did well, didn't he? He kept up with him as much as he could. I mean, let's be honest, Bowen was, was probably West Ham's biggest threat during that game. So it was a tough workout for him, and Gareth would have looked at him perhaps more than the others because he's had that little bit extra to do. But he did a decent job. You know, he, he, he got in there, he, he, he kept he kept in the, doing what we were, we were saying up here about just chasing back, putting the player under pressure. Uh, I thought he was probably the standout of the, of the trialists. Centre-half, very difficult for him. Uh, you know, and of course, once again, we, we were saying earlier about it was a difficult day for, for Stockdale in the first half because when you've got trialist defenders in front of, of you, they're, they're not always looking at what you're doing. They're just solely concentrating on what they're doing because they're trying to win a contract. Uh, centre midfield trialist uh, didn't look to fit the uh, the remit of the B team uh, trialist. He looked to be a bit older than than 18 to 20, but he looked experienced, looked good on the ball, um, a bit of height as well. And as the game went on in that first half, he, he grew to impress me a bit. Yeah, quite powerful, wasn't he? And, and as I said, they got a little bit more on the ball in the second half. The first half was very, very difficult for, for Wickham to get the ball. Second half, they got plenty of possession and it was easier to see what they could do with it and who wanted the ball. He was certainly fell into that category. I'm sure Gareth will have another look at him. And then moving into the second half, uh, eventually it was centre-back trialist, right-back trialist, uh, right midfield trialist. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought on the right-hand side between the pair of them, a lot of energy um, going into it and the right midfielder fashioned that chance himself and, and didn't score after that, winning the ball back. But again, you know, anyone caught the eye in, in those three? Well, that, uh, that incident, as you said, at the end where he, he won the ball and he, he broke away and, and nearly got himself a goal, you know, th that's what you're going to want to see. I don't think over the course of, of sort of 45 minutes for these guys, he'll, he'll have seen enough I think you'll want to see him again in a, in a game situation but with these players coming up, along there will be a situation soon where he can play 11 against 11 and have full scale training games there will be other friendly matches I'm sure he'll look to fit something else into as well as what they've got to, to give these players game time but um, you know what Gareth's like it, it'll be uh, very selective and very careful and it's certainly got to be better than what they've got or offering something better than what they've got to get a contract 
Well, there we are. Wickham's second uh, pre-season run out here at Adams Park. First game back at Adams Park uh, into this uh, new season. The full-time score was 5-1. It's not about scorelines, though, at this stage of the season, is it, in pre-season? It's about getting those minutes in and, and seeing who's, who's available, who's catching the eye, and who you're, who you're out of existing players. Uh, is in a good position to maybe make a claim for that first game a week on Saturday at the new Brentford Stadium in the Carabao Cup. Um, so it doesn't sound that far away, but plenty of business and plenty of minutes and training between now and then, Brian. Well, you know, a week's a long time in football. Two weeks, you know, you could see two or three players come in. You could see players go out on loan. Brentford's going to be a great test really will be they had a great season last year they're going to want to win in their new stadium as well aren't they first first proper game there so um you know that that's a good t- i believe it's a tv game as well is it so um uh, yeah know. it's actually on a sunday i've just remembered it's on on uh, a week on sunday uh, 12 o'clock kickoff uh, for that one it'll be on tv too so it'll also be on uh, on bbc three counties and on i follow um i believe so yeah so yeah, good way to start the season. And then we're back at Adams Park on the 12th of September against familiar opposition. First game in the Championship against Rotherham. Now, that's a big game, obviously a huge game. It's Wickham's first game in the Championship. But if they've got any hope of staying up in the Championship, they'll look at Rotherham before the fixes came out. They'll look at the games against their fellow promoted sides as being potentially six-pointers. Well, they'll, they'll look at certain teams and target them, no doubt about that. I did see someone post on social media the other week that a oh, Wickham will be lucky to get a point this season that's not going to happen we, we all know that you know this is a club coming up they've got the players have got momentum behind them over the course of the season they will pick up results they will shock a team here and there I, look it, it will be difficult this season there's no question about that but here we were last season saying exactly the same thing now this team's got heart it's got a manager that that you know knows his way around he's got good contacts as well and people want to work with him people want to come and play for the club and you know as much as they perhaps lack the the quality of sides like Derby and things like that, they have got the heart and they and they will get players in that will give them half a chance. Well, I tell you what, what I can guarantee it won't be dull, it won't be boring. Uh, right, here's to a great season, Brian. Thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon. Always good to see you here at Adams Park. Uh, we'll leave you with the full time score from pre season. Wickham Wanderers one, West Ham United five. Speak to you all soon. Many thanks to Phil Catchpole and Brian Jeeves for their commentary this afternoon. The final score from Adams Park, we can wonder as one, West Ham United 5. A much improved performance in the second half by Wickham. Uh, the damage, Colin, was really done um, in the first half. Exactly, but I, I guess you know you go into a game like this expecting a, a Premier League side to, to dominate and to, to score goals. Uh, with a bit of help from your own goalkeeper as well, but hopefully it's given you know Gareth a lot of sort of food for thought, especially with the the Carabao Cup games com- game coming up, hopefully games, and uh, obviously the start of the season not too far away now. You know there'll probably be some different combinations perhaps you'd like to try, um, uh, and sort of. But I'm sure there'll be you know especially it'd be interesting to see if we see any of the tr- trialists again. Yes. Yes, I mean, it, it's interesting as well that we haven't actually heard anything more about any pre-season friendlies. No. You know, I know that the season now isn't that long away, so um, just to reiterate, so yes, the game against Brentford is a week on Sunday, 12pm kickoff um, in the Carabao Cup. Um, but yes, we haven't heard anything else about any more friendlies. You would think that Gareth would want at least another one, possibly even two. Um, the fact that this B team is being talked about as well, you think that actually, probably, you know, uh, at least another couple of friendlies um, you know, w- would be the, the the path of the course. No, definitely, and perhaps even obviously some lower division or even non-league sides for for just them to, as you yeah. say, have a bit of a run out and, and get some from familiarity, especially for the younger, uh, the well, definitely the younger players, but also the, the newer newer players as well, just to sort of get to know their roles and, and, and find their find their feet, I suppose you'd say. Well, thank you very much, Colin. Um, remember that we are going to be here with the Wickham Wanderers show. It's very exciting. Yes, which we're, we're very much looking forward to. 10th of September. Uh, a podcast to watch out eight for as well. o'clock. Yes, indeed. And a podcast as well. Um, hopefully we'll have Gareth Ainsworth on um, every week um, from the press conference that normally will be t- taking place on a Thursday. Uh, we're hoping to get players in as well, uh, both from Wickham and from Wickham Wanderers Ladies. Um, Colin's already got a, a, a couple of contacts with regards to Wickham Wanderers Ladies. You've spoken to 
to Tara will, will be for. Um, and so we're hoping to, to get her and some of the girls on as well. Uh, but yes, that is going to be on the 10th of September between 7 and 8 o'clock right here on Wickham Sound. That is just about it from Colin and myself. Luke will be coming up after the news um, between 4 and 7 o'clock. Do remember that we have the Wickham Wanderers show starting on September the 10th. We do hope that you'll join us for that either on Wickham Sound or on the podcast. The Wickham Wanderers show coming soon to Wickham Sound.